Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you for coming. I'm Therese, um, Therese Sullivan. Oh, no, I don't think it is. Here, just use that. Just use that. It's not working. It's on. Hello. Okay, so I guess we're ready to get started. I am Therese Sullivan. I am a marketing director with Tridium, and I'm very excited today to bring you this panel discussion um, about smart women in smart buildings. Um, I uh, the impetus for this panel really started um, with thinking about how. Um, Right now, there's a lot of technology coming into buildings. Um, it's kind of creating an inflection point um, in that uh, occupants of buildings, 50% of which are women, um, if statistics run out, are, are um, very um, interested in how comfort and energy efficiency is um, being brought into the built environment, but also about how their privacy and security um, is being protected as, as that happens. Um, there's a lot of uh, people at the decision-making table, and um, I think both the men and the women, um, especially in this room, but in this industry, would like to bring some greater um, gender equality to those decisions. And, um, but that means welcoming more women into, um, into roles in this, very exciting industry. So we're um, bringing this panel of uh, women who have come from diverse pathways into their roles at various companies. Um, and it's a great mix, I think, with um, Gina Elliott from Buildings IoT, um, with Erin DeFries from LinkSpring. Um, we have Melissa Boutwell, who runs her own company, um, ASP International, and Kim Brown of Cochrane Supply. Uh, and remotely, Monica Calhoun, also from Tridium, um, who is uh, one of our customer um, managers, customer support managers. So um, it's great, and I want to kind of start this conversation off with um, Melissa, um, who's describing a little bit more about what our company's about, as well as some statistics um, of what's going on right now in the industry. Welcome, we're really excited to have y'all here. It is a great opportunity for our industry because I think everybody in this room understands that we need more workers in our industry. And if we can figure out how to engage more women and bring them into our industry, it can fill an important industry need. And so we wanted to share with you a few statistics just to let you know what the current situation is. If we look at the status right now of young women or women our age, it doesn't matter, all demographic types, we know that we have roughly three out of 100 technicians or field level staff members working that are women. And that is not enough, but the exciting thing is that it is three times, three orders of magnitude greater than when we started <laughs> on a bucket. <laughs> um, it might have been 0.01 um, when, when we first started out. I um, am excited to see that we've had those gains, but there's still a lot of opportunities for growth. The other thing is that we know in our offsite roles that are going to um, not necessarily be at the physical end user location that might be in software or integration type capacities, we're doing a little bit better. We're in around an 11 to 12 per 100 people in our workforce are women. Um, this is excellent and it is a significant improvement from several decades ago, but we still have a little bit room uh, still to travel. So how do we compare to our industry counterparts outside of this industry? When we look at the population of women in general in the IT sector, we know that we're standing pretty steady at around 25% of the workforce are women, regardless of which IT occupation they might be. If we look beyond just IT roles and we look at STEM-oriented roles that might include biotechnology, 
and other very technical roles in um, that include IT, but beyond that, we know we're doing better. We're surpassed that 25%, and it's around the 27 range. In engineering, pure engineering disciplines that might come from mechanical or electrical or you know true um, MEP style engineering roles, we know that we have roughly around, um, it alternates a little bit depending on whose statistics. She, I've been at ASHRAE working on several committees with this and it alternates between 18 and 20% depending on the year and the data and how exactly it was measured. So we have a good basis to grow if we can at least achieve the, the level of percentages that we have in some comparable industries. Now, what is interesting is when we look at our end customer, our end customer being decision makers in the facilities themselves, we know that roughly 25% of the facility management roles, and we chose purposefully not to go all the way down into frontline roles, we have a lot of statistics on the frontline roles, but those are often going to be in occupations that are not comparable to the occupations in our smart industry. So we stuck with those frontline supervisory and managerial roles, and we know that it's roughly 25%. What is really interesting is looking at the growth of women in CFO level decision making positions that many facility managers report up to, and they're often in that top administrative role, and we do see significant growth in, in those in customer roles, and around the 27, 28%, depending on what type of organization it is, you're gonna see some variations with the type of organization. Now, if we think about this as an opportunity, is there anyone in here that would like to do better than three out of 100 of our field staff workforce being represented by women? Just raise your hand. All right. That means we are all like-minded. And when we think about what are those positions that we really want to fill, um, we, we know on this panel, we all suffer from vacancies in three key positions that require strong technical aptitude to be able to succeed. And those we call field specialists. Every company is gonna have a different word for it. It may be automation specialists, control specialists, technicians, lots of different words for it, but it's all that entry level software related field personnel. And integration specialists, we've just chosen this because it is a basket that includes more than just the controls engineering role. It includes many of the topics that you talked about today and some of the specialties that we have to pull in from IT and, and other disciplines as well. And project specialists. There is an enormous opportunity to bring project-oriented capabilities into our industry if we come up with ways to help them um, get up to speed and to move into those positions. So today, what we were hoping is that we would be able to discuss some of these opportunities and hear from the panel on how we fill these positions with women. Yep. Um, and I thought it would be good to start with um, just talking to each of the uh, additional panelists, maybe um, with Gina about how she arrived in her, um, her current role and her various roles um, in building automation and controls. Um, well, I, I didn't come through uh, the standard way, I should say. I have a pretty eclectic background, so most people would assume that I have an engineering degree and I don't. Um, I'm a lot like Aaron here, but I've, I've got a, a degree in criminology and I started out my professional career um, as a legal rep for uh, inmates in an adult male prison and I've worked with gang members. I've been a private investigator and um, you know and it actually just led into one thing and the other. I, I ended up doing investigations for an insurance company and then I, ended, I went back to school and got an MBA and I started um, being a little bit more analytical. I used that investigative skill that I had. And then I started learning about technology and how how much of a technology is an enabler um, to for efficiency, um, how it, you know, just about anything, you know. And so from there, um, I kind of hit the glass ceiling, decided to go off on my own. I started working with an IT company 
And uh, we started doing a lot of hotels and I learned just from doing hotel rooms. They are like a little mini building where the systems, they've got a, a you know, lighting, access, security, HVAC, all of that. And I just started learning and then I got lucky and I got a job with this uh, wonderful uh, company, Smart Buildings was the name, and they were one of the very first in the industry that was actually doing design of smart building back in, what, 2007. And um, they were all about openness and interoperability and um, making the, the, the building, you know, better to manage. And, um, and so from there, that's kind of how I ended up where I ended up. And um, so it wasn't kind of a straight path. Uh, the interesting thing of um, it is, you know, every time after years of being in here, I thought, it, I used to come to these things, and I, you'd never see, if you saw one woman, you knew who she was, <laughs> you know, I mean, all the conferences, and uh, I never thought that I would be here in this industry as long as I would, as I have, and, um, and it was only just a few weeks ago, I thought about it, and I said, why, you know, why did I even stay? And honestly, it was because there was such an abundance of opportunity, you know, in everything. It was more so than any any career I ever had. It was just such an abundance of opportunity to do different things, um, whether it's on the technical side, whether it's on the marketing side, the sales side. Um, and then the other thing was uh, people embraced you and they would share their knowledge with you, which helped you to grow as a professional. So that's kind of how I got here, long-winded. <laughs> no, that's great. Um, Aaron, Aaron DeFries. So I am very similar to Gina. Um, I actually have a degree in law enforcement administration with minors in sociology, criminology, and legal philosophy. I was actually going to be a lawyer someday. Um, obviously, I didn't make it there. Um, like Gina, I was actually a private investigator and I grew up in the industry. My father actually was a pipe fitter and he worked for a mechanical contractor and eventually he bought his own business, a controls company. Um, so I, from the age of three, I've had my own hard hat, job mm -hmm. sites, collecting turtles, all that kind of stuff. Um, back in 97, late 97, I had just finished a case that I was working on. And when you finish an undercover case, you generally can't start another one until you adjudicate your first one because mm -hmm. you can't be undercover and go into court at the same time. So I was in the middle um, adjudicating and my dad actually needed a salesperson to fill in because his salesperson was going to go out for six months surgery. Sure. I like talking to people. I can handle sales. No problem. That was in February of 1998. My dad retired in 2011. I'm still here. Um, I started, my first product line was the Robert Shaw product line with the Barbara Coleman. So I came up through the whole CB and Vences. Every two years, I was changing my shirt logo, that path. Um, spent about three and a half years with Train before I came to Langspring. I've been with Langspring since 2018. Um, I've been a Niagara person from the days of R2. Um, so I've pretty much gone through all the path. I can do line by line code, the whole nine yards. I spent, God, I hate to say this because this is going to make me sound old. I spent 20 years in the field on the bucket, tool bags, laptops, porta potties, the whole nine yards. Um, so that's where Gina and I kind of differ. She figured out how to do it the smart way faster. I kind of did it the hard way. Um, today, my son is a first year electrical apprentice and he has now stolen all of my tools. Um, and I've kind of moved into a management role. I was part of this panel two years ago when we were in Orlando. At the time, I was an application engineer, mostly just programming. Today, I am the professional services manager at Linkspring. Two years ago, we had three application engineers. Today, we have nine application engineers, two panel builders, three um, project managers. Uh, we have an administrative assistant, and we still have an entire four-person technical support group. So we have grown exponentially in the two years since we were here, um, and we have learned a lot of things. I still have no other females in my department besides my administrative assistant. I'm also one of the NAGRA and four certified trainers for Linkspring, and I've been doing that for a little over a year, and I can tell you I've had no women in any of my classes in over a year, and we do training classes every month. So we're still hurting and we're still looking for it. The industry as a whole, male, female, doesn't matter. Um, we're hurting mm -hmm. and we need to find that path. We need to find that reason. And like Gina, 
the thing I love about this is I told you I started here. I did sales. I did, you know, maintenance contracts. Y2K came around. So now all of a sudden the world's going to end. We got to do all these chip changes, right? Everybody, if you're old enough in this room, some of you guys are kind of young. Um, everybody was going to worry because, you know, come January 1st, everything was going to die. That's really where I started into controls. And I've grown through different things. I'm a trainer. I'm a manager. There are so many opportunities. It's just finding where you want to go, getting into that door and determining, oh, the bucket's not really my thing, but I really like sales. I really like marketing. I, I like tech support. Those opportunities are there. I'm a Microsoft certified person as well across multiple different platforms. Those are all things that are opportunities available to us. It's just how do we get that word out? How do we get women and men and you know anybody interested in what we do and the opportunities. Once you get in, you can go anywhere. You can go anywhere in the country with these jobs. There's so many openings. I think somebody said at one point in time, there's like 80,000 opportunities in our industry in the United States alone across every aptitude. How do we get there? Can I redirect? Uh, um, please. Actually, Gee, here's the law thing. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to comment, Gina? Yeah, I wanted to say um, about my, you know, our trajectory. We, we kind of started the same and then we kind of diverged a little bit. So for me, I've held um, business development, sales, marketing, um, even design work. And now at Feldings IoT, my position is actually radically different than anything I've done before. And uh, so now I lead a, um, a, the digital services group and the software group. And I've got about 40% of my staff are women. And, um, and now actually when I put out to hire, say, data scientists, um, I get a lot of women applicants and they, they really embrace that um, because there's a lot of creativity as, as well as analytical ability in what we do from a software perspective from that programming and, and building out the feature sets and onboarding buildings and things like that. So that is one thing that has changed in, in that. And, and they do love, I mean, a lot of my, my staff that are women, um, they really excel at that and really embrace that. So it, it's, it's other career paths to where you do see some progress. Yep. Yeah, I was going to um, invite Monica Calhoun into the conversation at this point as well, because I think um, springboarding from Melissa's point about really the greatest opportunity is field specialists and part of the description of that job is it's customer facing and you're really the person um, that determines whether customers are um, advocates and evangelists for your product lines or whether they're sort of lukewarm. And uh, Monica holds one of those positions at Tritium um, that is very customer facing. And like Gina and like Erin, she's kind of had an interesting pathway into this position. And I, you know, she is, well, in my opinion, one of the most important people at Tritium. So take it away, Monica. <laughs> Thanks, Therese. Um, am, I, am I audible? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Perfect. Okay, All right. great. Thank you. Yeah, so I um, don't have the background that Gina and Aaron have in legal. However, I actually responded to a blind ad um, <laughs> that was posted by Tritium. So my entryway into building automation at Tritium was as a part time accounting clerk. And oddly enough, the hiring manager, um, we had an affiliation from her previous company. She was an auditor for the nonprofit where I was working at the time um, when I responded to the blind ad. So needless to say, it was a comfortable conversation in the interview and she took a chance on me. Um, and over the years, I have been able to evolve from a part-time accounting clerk through the channel of direct customer support. Um, and I now actually, I'm, in, I'm part of the customer um, operations um, department and it's more on the technical side though. My group manages the systems that are customer facing. So yes, we do still have um, a huge impact on the customer. Um, it's all about the customer experience and, and that is our main goal. And so uh, 17 years ago um, is where I made my entryway into the building automation systems. And, and you know, I would say not necessarily or exclusively due to my skill, and you know um, my abilities but more or less i was able to be um 
assigned to organizations where leaders recognize the value that I offer and, you know, recognize my contribution was able to promote me through those channels. And, and I think really, you know, I know that we're still a small percentage in the industry, but I think that is the key um, to have people actually recognize your contributions and your values uh, to help propel you into those, you know, further, further along that road and along that pathway. And it's, um, I've been fortunate enough to work with some highly skilled technical um, people. And um, what I find is that, you know, the engineers, they really like sharing knowledge with you. Um, I haven't had the experience where I've been looked down upon or frowned upon when I ask questions and wanting to learn because I do hunger to learn and become more technically inclined. They love to teach. So I would say, you know, for the women um, who have that exposure to take the opportunity to really learn from your teammates and your associates, they love to teach. Exactly. Um, and uh, to, um, to bring Gina's point back into this, um, it's very much a software role um, because we have a software product and the data um, data aspects, women and men, we can all, we can all <laughs> go along that trajectory and learn the same stuff, um, and especially on the job for me. Um, so back to Melissa. Well, first, thank you, all of you for being here today and being interested in this topic and hopefully we'll be able to engage even beyond this conversation. But I have some similarities and differences from the, the other panelists that have been here. I, like many people in our industry, whether it's a men or women, I accidentally fell into the industry. I, I don't know as many people that purposely came into the industry. And I, my academic training was as an economist um, in plant efficiency in the days of Sam Walton. I'm showing my age and, and how much I cover my, my gray hair. And that I entered my career in the late 1980s and the early 1990s in the Wild West days of you know, DDC just starting out. But I started in industrial automation. And my job was to deliver results for things like being able to improve our customer promise, being able to have better inventory accuracy, being able to reduce our scrap rate with manufacturing processes and equipment in the medical device industry at the exact time when the AIDS crisis was causing a high demand for medical exam gloves and surgical gloves, very similar to masks and things today. And we had a need to um, expand very rapidly. And just like um, our, our other panelists, opportunity. It was the word opportunity that made it such an exciting career path. And I stumbled into controls and automations and learning that they were the tools and the instruments that I needed to be able to deliver on a promise. And after we moved plant manufacturing overseas, I did not want to raise my future children in Malaysia and Thailand, and I moved into utilities and SCADA systems and spent the majority of my career, 17 years, as a systems integrator, spent time on a bucket, didn't spend 20 years on a bucket, um, but and had the, the opportunity to do project management, to actually do sales and business development, and you know some creative product development as well because it was all about service and knowing what the service leadership needed to be and finding opportunity in the service opportunities that we had at that time. And I accidentally found buildings and uh, through my SCADA systems work and through projects on energy and sustainability in it, that my state government had. And it was only after I accidentally found out about building automation through central plants that I thought, wow, this is kind of a cool place. Buildings are nice. They don't smell like wastewater <laughs> treatment plants. And I spent a lot of time in wastewater treatment plants. Um, so, you know, for me, I did have an unusual pathway and it has been one that has been blessed with many people being very gracious with my crazy questions and being free to learn from hundreds of people along the way. Today, and I, you know, if you fast forward, I've also had the opportunity to serve as the building owner. 
um, had a privilege to be responsible for systems at a sister convention center um, in Orlando, Florida, where we were in 2020. Mm -hmm. And in that role, I really started to understand the building owner's issues from a different point of view than I had from a systems integration standpoint. And when we realized how challenging this problem was, I decided to be a professor. Okay, so we're gonna do something about it and went back to learn how to try and get more people in the industry. And I can tell you, it is tough. It is tough out there. Our colleges and our universities are in a, a challenging situation to supply people for us. And it is difficult to attract women into technical fields. It is very, very challenging. And our company, the company that we founded in 2018, our, the name of the company is Automation Strategy and Performance. ASP is the nickname, but the purpose of our company is as a strategic planning and performance management company to help companies overcome the strategic workforce limits to their growth and expansion. And we have tools and products you know, to help with that, just like anybody. But what I'm most excited about is that we have three women teaching. You know, and we have women that are in project management roles, one of whom is with us today um, that came from a similar background. When I heard that she had a criminology background, I already knew my buddies here <laughs> had great success coming in. So let's give it a whack. Come on. You know, and I think that that's part of the opportunity that we have is to figure out how to help people come into our industry that may not necessarily have all of the training that we think that they should have to start the position, but how we equip them and help them get into the roles that we have on the screen today. So that's my story. Okay, um, my name is Kim Brown. I'm the Chief People Officer at Cochrane Supply. We're a distributor of smart building uh, products, mainly building automation lines, and also some traditional HVAC and burner control uh, products as well. So. I also answered a blind ad in the newspaper and was physically printed. I went and bought because I needed a job and uh, I got hired to be a receptionist. So I got lucky in the fact that I stumbled into a company that um, very much believes from promoting from within and professional development and growth. And so I've been able to work my way up into the role that I'm at and I take that with me in everything that we do. So we focus very heavily on professional development of our people and have built extensive internal training programs. And we take pride in mentoring people, right? So we have to hire them. So my, my job now has focused mainly on um, recruiting, retaining at company culture and strategic business planning. So like we mentioned before, 50% of the population are women and yet we have so few women and it is a little discouraging to me that there's still only a handful of men in here. There are more than the last one a couple of years ago, um, but I'm happy to see so many women here because it's, it, this is great, but I want, I would like the men to also be advocates for hiring women as well. That is going to be very important. Um, I was talking with Paul in the back there about, about initiatives. He's trying to get started because it, it, it is, it is an issue. Um, but for me, the most important thing when recruiting someone is looking for the aptitude. They may not have the technical skills or the background, but if they have the aptitude to learn and they have the right attitude, you can teach them whatever you need to know. So I hire a lot of women. I do. And, and I, I do come across certain positions where they are, the resumes are more male dominated, but I, I do make a point to make sure that all the women are given a fair shot for any role, even if it is the technical IT support positions or developer roles, things like that, that I'm trying to fill, not just administrative roles. We see a lot of women in the building automation industry. How many of them are in marketing roles and finance roles? They're not always in that technical background. And I like to see more of that. And we can do that through mentorship and taking the time to promote these women that are under your wing and give them every opportunity to say, you know what, you're actually pretty good at this. I'm going to have you go do a public speaking role or, you know what, I'm going to have you mentor with the sales technical sales team and maybe they can, you know, give you some more tools to further your career and advancement. And we have to do that deliberately by finding people that are capable and pushing them forward. We cannot always be passive with that. And that's how we get more women into leadership roles and into these technical roles that they may not have 
had the opportunity to before. So, so I, I take a look at the background. I think it's important. Education is important, but I don't have a four year degree. I, I didn't come from a criminology background, you know, I just I just answered the phones for a year and then they were like, you know what, you're pretty good at doing some other things. Let me give you more. And and we, we seek out to give the people in our entry level roles the ability to grow within the company as we grow, because you're use, you're already training them on what you do. So we look to them already as, you know, you already have a foundational layer of how we operate. You know, maybe we could put you in another role. We do a lot of job crafting and that has worked out so well for us. Our director of products and marketing is a woman. Her name's Nicole Conklin. She actually just stepped out, but she also had a similar path to me where she started um, at, the, at the bottom and worked her way up because she's, she's technically minded. And we have women in, in technical sales roles. So we, we've been given the opportunity and now we're all running with it. And, and I think that Cochrane Supply, when you look at us as a company, we have more women than most com than most of our contemporaries. But I am seeing a positive change. And so I'm really happy to hear that. But to me, that's the most important part that I'm passionate about is, is trying to elevate under other women and to teach them some tools that they need to know in order to be better advocates for mm -hmm. themselves. What can you do to say, you know what? Be a little more assertive. Don't take that whole women should be seen and not heard stuff from the 50s. Yeah, shove it. Not interested. You know what? Here's what I want to make. How do I get there? And men ask those questions. And I try to teach, especially, you know, younger people when I'm, you know, maybe interviewing them for, for a, a lower level, entry level job. And I say, okay, what are your salary requirements? They all go, oh, I don't know. Well, no, what do you want to make? And then I say, OK, well, when I ask you that again, I'm going to pretend like we didn't have this conversation. You think about it and then come back to me. You know, and I, I do every interview that I have. I have never had a man say that they already know what they want. So I am trying to teach some of the younger girls to advocate for themselves as well. So you're, you're the one in charge of your career. You're the one in charge of, of where you end up. So speak up when you need to. So, okay. Therese, may I jump off of that real quick? Right. I was going to, just before you jump, I was going to okay. jump more time, is that um, this industry, building automation, is very collaborative. Um, we've got to collaborate with IT. We've got to collaborate with facilities. It, there's a lot of skills that are um, statistically, I think it's a hard thing to gather statistics on, but um, strengths of women in terms of listening, um, finding compromise um, where compromise needs to be speaking up um, that uh, that diversity on any in any industry is important but I think it's particularly important in building automation because it really isn't some person be it a guy in a garage inventing something himself and bringing it to market um, it's very much trying to find consensus of uh, competing interests. Um, I, I think having women on the team is a real strength in that area. Take it away, Erin. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I don't want to see oh, Monica too, but Erin. Okay, so to jump off of that, um, I don't know how many of you in here are business owners. Um, I don't know how many of you are managers, but I live in Illinois. Link Spring is actually in Missouri. For years now where I live, and I live right on the border of Illinois and Iowa, so I have literally two states, two sets of communities that I work with. Overall, we have actually started programs with our local high schools and our local community colleges. Seniors in high schools now have an opportunity to spend their second semester of high school interning with local mechanical contractors. Whether that's as an application engineer or integration type person, entry level controls, whether it's learning pipe fitting, whether it's learning electrical. And like I said, my son just turned 19 and he actually is a first year apprentice with an electrical union. Those are opportunities also as business owners, as HR managers, as department managers. Um, that we can go out into our community also and be able to mentor and teach. Let's face it, you do not need a college degree to work in most of the opportunities that we have in this industry, whether it's something you know on the bucket programming, whether it is being a fitter, an electrician, um, any of the difference, you know, unions we actually have out there. I'm from Illinois, so I guess everything's union to me. Not all states are union, but you get the points. Uh, yep, see, there you go. Um, even, you know, Gina's opportunities, really where she's at now, 
Maybe, maybe not. So most of us on here, you know, you don't need that. You need somebody to show you what's out there. You need somebody to guide you, to mentor you. And I feel like as business owners, as managers, as people who have grown up in this industry and found ourselves where we are today, we have that responsibility. You know, Melissa brought up something about STEM. I truly feel like the industry we are in is a STEM industry. If you think about what we do, you have to apply math. You have to apply science, especially now, because now we're dealing with air quality and you have to be able to turn on a dime to respond to whatever that building occupants needs are. Whether we're dealing with UV lights, whether we're dealing with CO2 issues, whether we've got occupancy, our industry is growing and expanding and our systems are starting to tie in more. As HVAC people, we're also seeing that Division 23 in our spec books and Division 25s are starting to tie together. And we're seeing integrations now from Division 26, which is your lighting integrations. We have to be able to move on that and we have to be able to share that knowledge and our experiences. I've been doing this a very, very long time. And today I still talk to young engineers Maybe they're right out of college. Maybe they've only got two years. They've never been in the field. They don't realize that there's a huge difference between theory and practice. So as mentors, as the people who have been there and done this, that's our opportunity to be able to show that. It's our opportunity to be able to share with others and grow them, mentor them, see that there is something there. There's an aptitude there. Maybe you don't belong in a bucket. Maybe you don't have that thick skin and you can't stand the Porta Johns and the sub-zero temperatures, <clears throat> but maybe you actually belong in a technical support role or mm -hmm. a sales role or a marketing role. We have to be able to identify that. And I think that's one of the greatest things I think that you're talking about with Cochrane is, you know, and even within LingSpring, we backwards mentor our folks to be able to give them the opportunity to grow. We have goals meetings and professional development meetings every couple of months and we try to identify what people's trainings are, what their desires are and try to find that right path and that right fit, whether it's within professional services or some other department. Mm -hmm. Oh, there you go. <laughs> was Monica gonna say something? Yeah, I was. I, I, so I was just gonna write off of, you know, what Kim started. Erin said she was gonna jump, I'm not that bold, I'm not gonna jump, but I'm gonna ride off of what um, Kim was saying, referring to mentoring, um, you know, and, and as far as leadership and, you know, a huge point that I missed um, in my intro is that, you know, the division for Honeywell that um, I work for now is um, the CEO is a woman. Go figure. Um, and she really champions for women in technology. Um, you know, there's this huge initiative to continue to grow, <clears throat> grow the women in technology um, and to grow that group um, to introduce us to new things and, and um, you know, expand our knowledge in the area. Of course, she's going to advocate for that. Um, and like I said, me um, having been at Tritium for 17 years, which is a part of the HCU division, um, there were a handful of women, and, and I do see it growing, and I and I do see more diversity. Obviously, I'm a woman of color, as you can see. So there wasn't much diversity when I started. I think there were maybe two um, of us. But as we expand more into the technology field, the door is being opened more and more. Um, not only to women, but for, you know, the diversity, um, you know, in our culture as well. Um, I was um, living in Richmond for all of my life, and I recently moved to the Atlanta area. So walking into the Atlanta office, um, as you can imagine, was very encouraging seeing, you know, more women that look like me in leadership technology positions. And, you know, and again, to Erin's point, you know, um, I don't have any field experience, and I also don't have a four-year degree. Um, so there's opportunity for you there if you um, share, you know, your ideas and, you know, your insight and things, um, share it in the forum. You know, no idea I find is a dumb idea. And a lot of times when you're working in this type of industry, you know, some of the conversation can be really technical and really high level. Um, and once I process and regurgitate it, I like to simplify things. I tell my group now, um, because I work with a group of engineers and we're solutions providers for these building owners and these systems integrators and the distribution channel. I tell them I write pseudocode. And so I just kind of regurgitate and translate what they say into very simple terms or I'll throw a simple idea out there. And you'll be surprised oftentimes in a group, in a brainstorming group, they're just like, oh, I didn't think of that. 
So don't be afraid, you know, because you may not have all the technical knowledge or the technical jargon to, you know, share your ideas and you'd be surprised that who can recognize, you know, um, your skills, your abilities, um, you know, your knowledge, you could be an expert in any field. Wow, that was great. Thank you, Monica. Um, I, I, we're um, going to allow some time for questions. I think it would be great if uh, yeah. to see anybody that also might have an interesting story to tell. Um, sure. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> So Monica kind of touched on it, and you guys talked about how, you know, the characteristics of what a great potential employee would be, but what other characteristics of a great mentor, like what, what are those characteristics? So I think um, that's a really great question, by the way. Um, I, I think for me, first and foremost, is someone with good observational skills um, and that has a compassionate or empathetic nature um, because you want to make sure that you're you're taking the time with these with these people to listen to their ideas, even though they're new um, and, and to, to see, wow, that was a really great question you asked. They're so curious, you know, what 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 can I do to give them more to encourage that type of behavior um, so and and also care about their career so you know when i when i'm mentoring new people that work for me i always say you know what you want my job one day come take it and i mean that because i'm going to do everything i can to push you up the ladder there's going to be somewhere else for me to go i'm not threatened by that and i i, I encourage that um, and and i think that that ob observing what they want to do and helping them reach those goals is very important I, I would love to add to that the a desire to replace yourself. Yes, that's it what I mean. You take my job. Probably <laughs> one of the single most important leadership skills we need to be developing in our industry. Period. Mm -hmm. Whether you're a man or a woman, um, right now some of the work that we do with some of the largest and brightest companies in our industry. We know that we have data that shows the percentage of people that feel stuck in their job and they rate themselves as having expertise in that job, but they feel stuck, which makes them a prime target for recruiters and, and other things. But what we when we dig into that and we discover why they feel stuck, oftentimes they've never learned to crave the skill of learning to replace yourself. <clears throat> and to have the confidence to know that that is a great thing for your career. And so if, you are, if you're a decision maker in this room and a hiring authority, to, to Aaron's question a minute ago, raise your hand, raise your hand. Okay, the, an actionable thing that we could all do today is in your downstream direct reports, start encouraging them to want to learn how to replace themselves and then know that those are skills that they need to develop because they're different than whatever expertise you had to do well in your job. Oh, really quickly, I, I, there's a couple of things I say to people that work for me and one of them is um, I want to I want to help you be the person I want to work for. Mm -hmm. Mine's a little simpler. I'm just not afraid to be the dumbest person in the room. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, at the end of the day, good for you. If you know more than me, if you can teach me, that's excellent. So, yeah, I'm not afraid to be the dumbest person in the room. I've perfected it. That's how we learn. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's true. I'm looking for the person to replace me when I retire. Mm hmm. And one of the things I really, I know all of you. We've been in this industry a fair amount of time. And one of the things that really disheartens me as well is there is definitely not enough women in this industry that have this, you know, that are being able to fill any position. It doesn't, just because you're marketing or whatever, it doesn't matter. You need to be able to go to any of those positions, bring that team into a new point of view, because that's where I see this industry fail, is it's the same old, same old. Whether it's the general contractor, whether it's the control contractor, whether it's the MSI, when you bring a team of different ideas and different core values, 
you develop a skill set that's very unique and you become a leader in your marketplace. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that you just hit on, I think, is a critical skill that more young women need to learn those, those strategies of vision, alignment, and execution. And they need to start learning them very early. One of the things that I do as an advisory board member in many schools, whether it's an engineering or a business school, is that those project management skills starting very early in someone's tenure to learn vision, alignment, and execution. It can be with a very small vision. We're going to complete this job on time, on budget, on schedule. <laughs> you know, um, that can be a simple thing. But learning how to make that message very clear with a group of people that will attach to that vision and then align the people and resources and, and components of that for, for execution and then sustaining momentum. You know, it, sustaining momentum is a challenge as well. So I, I would support your desire to do that in, in let's all see how we can help build those skills in women early and those transcend any technical skill. It doesn't matter what it is. Um, one thing I would say probably to everybody in this room, do not be afraid to network. Mm. Right. Okay. It, this is a highly collaborative environment. Um, and most of the people here will do whatever it is to help coach you. Or as we all said, I mean, I am definitely, I am most comfortable being the dumbest person in the room. Mm -hmm. I am most comfortable with that, uh, which means I'm always learning and, uh, so, but it's highly collaborative, network, network, network. Don't reach out, you know, LinkedIn if you have a question. Um, and, you know, I know a lot of people in this room and honestly, most of the jobs I've had in this, when I've changed to a different company is because someone called me up and said, I got this position, I think you'd be great for it. And that's because, you know, um, I've networked. Um, that's because I've tried to give back as much as I've gotten. Um, and it's because overall, everyone in this industry really is about being helpful. So I'd always say, please network with each other. Um, you know, don't be afraid to reach out to someone. Mm -hmm. And to take that one step further, don't be afraid to be the only, for the, the girls in this room, the women in this room, don't be afraid to be the only woman in the room. Amen. Yeah. Every single one of us at some point in our career was the only woman in the room. I'm thrilled to look out and actually see others because I am accustomed to be on a panel and nothing but a CMN. So, <laughs> I, I mean, it, nothing, that, not that there's anything wrong with that, but so, but just don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to be who you are. Don't be afraid to speak, act, behave who you are and how you are, because that's not, that's not what you're going to be judged upon. And that's not what's going to hinder or encourage you. Your knowledge, your experience, your confidence is what's really going to get you where you need to go and who you know. Reach out to any one of yes. us women up here. Reach out to mm -hmm. Monica or Therese. We're all here. We'll all be happy to tell you how mm -hmm. we came up, how we got there, and what we know. And help you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So there's Bill back there. But before, oh, before we give the there. stage to Bill, um, <laughs> I was going to say that we're also, I, I do see a lot of young people in this room, and we're a very young industry. And I think Gina is a good example of that, um, in that the thing she's doing, um, and I, I, it is the way of the future. People have to retrain all the time to get the um, broad spectrum of skills that you need. You have to understand data. You have to understand how to the physics of moving water and air through a building, and you understand the job of the facilities manager, what comfort means to people, which is kind of biological. There's all these things coming together. You're often, the well, you feel that way, the dumbest person in the room as people go off on one of those tangents in any direction. Um, so youth and that beginner's mind is actually a advantage. Um, and I love what people said, be yourself. Um, Aaron said that, uh, it's really good to be to be yourself. And one of the things I wanted to get to also is all the training resources. Is that part of it also is to is to bring the goods. Um, you know, if, if you need to be Niagara certified, get Niagara certified. There's all sorts of ways to get Niagara certified. Um, if you need uh, to learn a little bit more um, 
in some other area, there's just so many ways you can get badges and certifications and um, uh, things that Melissa is doing um, at every level, the community college level, the um, university level, the tech school level. Another thing that we haven't brought up again coming out of the pandemic is a lot of people are wanting to switch careers. Um, that, I, that ability to find online training resources. I mean, we're making history today with Monica talking to us from Atlanta. Um, everything you can do in terms of virtual learning, online learning um, that maybe was seen heretofore a little impossible um, has all of a sudden become very possible. Um, so maybe people could comment on that. Yeah. Hey, I got a question. Um, I feel like at least some of the groups that I've been a part of in different organizations, a lot of the success really drives from the support system. Like we talk about all the people in this room that are interested in the topic. And you mentioned having a session previously at previous conferences. I didn't know, maybe it's just I'm not aware of it yet, but just any kind of continual organization within ASHRAE or you know, a grouping of this type of team focused on this. Maybe not just specifically with controls, but let me name one of the trees. And then secondly, any other organizations you all may have seen success in some of this gender inclusion? Well, there there are subsets of other organizations. You know, ASHRAE has um, some, some cl collaborative groups that focus on encouraging young women. I know um, the Association of Energy Engineering, I've been a part of SeaWheel and sat on some boards and done various different things to try and encourage and magnetize young women um, or people changing careers. And, you know, we've even talked about that even in this group is, you know, is there a place for that? One of, one of the challenges that we have is sometimes we all have um, membership exhaustion, you know, and um, I, none of us are looking for extra things on our calendar. But what we can do is be very intentional about picking women to mentor. Um, you know, right now in my company, I have, uh, I have three direct reports that are young women that are moving into this industry from other areas. And it's exciting, it's exciting. We've also sent others off to work for some of you that, you know, started out in our company. So, um, but it's a great point and it's something that we should just continue this session um, and figure out how we collaborate. Yeah, I mean, to your point, I think I'm still part of that 3% of 100. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why I'm still looking for women because I am that very, very small group. Um, those are those ones where we start trying to look at the high school kids and start trying to look at the community college kids because we have to grow them up, whether they're male or female. I mean, this is a true statement of either gender, to be honest with you. But that is where we need to start looking at those groups. I do belong to the National Association of Women in Construction because I did start with a mechanical electrical contractor. Um, so I actually do belong to that organization as well, but that's another mm -hmm. women facing organization. One other one uh, in the semi 24 exchange focusing on mission critical, the uh, WinCo Women in Mission Critical initiative that I've seen, at least in our local Carolinas chapter, a lot of uh, good collaboration and conversations starting here, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's also a women of HVACR group that mm -hmm. um, women can join, and uh, I I also, I, just to build on a little bit, Aaron said earlier that we're, we're in STEM. Of course we are. HVAC is science. You know, it's, it's, the, it's the science of the air, water, but also it's, it is technology too. So it's kind of a double, double whammy. So I would encourage women to join um, women in tech groups. There's, there's one in Michigan I'm in, and there's also some national organizations that you can belong to because they have mentorship programs too on how you can sharpen some skills to um, move your way up through technology fields as well. I want to, I'm so sorry, I want to add to that really quick. And if, if you don't, <clears throat> sorry, have time to hear about it here, but yesterday our industry made some cool announcements that for the first time ever we have our own Emerging Technology Apprenticeship Program that has defined our occupations as IT STEM occupations. And for the first time, we actually, as an industry, have access to grants. We have access to programs that can make it easy. You mentioned getting Tritium certification. Um, mm -hmm. If you're just coming into the industry, it may be intimidating looking at the price tag of that, and you're not, you're not sure you know, if that's something that you'll be good at. 
that's what some of these programs are out there to do. And now that we have a formal apprenticeship program that is based on the IT framework for OT, we actually have some real assets to make some substantial changes for our industry. All right. Um, well, there's one other thing that came out of your um, research that uh, is women who are interested in sustainability and um, there's the new buzzword, which is ESG, environmental social governance, um, that that has been a pathway um, to um, the C-suite in some cases to management positions that they, they've added these sustainability league certifications is would be a, another example, um, which is almost another pathway into this industry because really to get a handle on um, the carbon footprint of a building, you've got to understand controls. Um, but interfacing or again, as Paul mentioned, getting that breadth of knowledge of what is that ESG, um, where, certifications, conversations, where is that going? Being part of that, I think, um, as women, mothers, sisters, et cetera, the whole climate action thing is, is very attractive to a lot of women. So I think probably one of the biggest takeaways, at least for me, what I'm hearing across this panel and even some of the questions, um, two of the biggest things I think the takeaways are is one, as an entry level applicant or somebody who's looking to get into this industry, really honestly, the only thing you need to be good at is the willingness to learn. I think we've pretty much proven across this panel that there is absolutely no single point entry into this industry. You don't have to be an engineer. You don't, yes, you have to have some technical aptitude, but that can be taught. Uh, my mom used to tell me I couldn't fight my way out of a wet paper bag unless somebody gave me the instructions first. And here I am, <laughs> like that one? Yes. Um, and here I am, you know, 20 some years later. And obviously I figured out how to get out of that paper bag. So you as an entry level person or even looking to get into something, you have to be good at wanting to learn. And as mentors, we have to be good at wanting to teach. And I think that's probably the two biggest things, at least for me, that's always been my personal message. Be willing to learn and be willing to share and teach. Gina? I really want to know what the question is Bill has. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks for putting yourselves out there. You know, for the betterment of the entire industry. The question is simple as you've given lots of great actions you can do, things you can do. Have we gotten to the actual source of this 3%? I would love to share what the research says on that. <clears throat> so I think it comes down to something that is near and dear to your, your uh, heart, Bill, is messaging and marketing. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we've had several conversations about how important that is. And I think that this issue in and of itself is probably one of the most important to take that seriously. Right now, if you look at in technical schools, we find that only 3% of young women right now in college, at the college age, actually have any interest or intention of pursuing anything of a technical nature, 3%. So those are not very good odds for us. But if you look at what three said about the importance of ESG factors, and what they care about and being able to make an impact, they do have interest in careers that make an impact. And if we as an industry can collaborate to be able to tell our story of why we are such cool people, all the great things that we've done and the things that we've achieved over the past 30 years, then that will be a way for us to magnetize. And I think honestly, Bill, that messaging is the single most important next step action item for us on this issue. I always say this is the big, the biggest industry that no one's ever heard of unless you're in it. So <laughs> it's huge. And also um, getting people to, to want to do these jobs just by simply letting them know that they exist. It, that's huge. And, and one thing that Aaron said last year, I, I just, I loved, you know, the fact that humor is so important and the 3% is in that area that we need the most. I mean, field facing technicians. 
And we need as many women that have sat on a bucket like Erin and I have to actually talk about that experience. I have raised four children and had an incredibly excellent career that I love. And I did my time on a bucket and would trade it for nothing because what I learned from that has made me be able to connect at all levels of an organization. And if there are, are ways that we can attract women, if you have women in your organization, if you have young women sitting you know, at that field level, we want to know, we wanna create videos about them. We wanna create marketing you know, about their great experience, not just all of us, yeah, but, we're kind of old for that now. Yeah, yeah. I know. But, you know, we <laughs> want to get that that young uh, population and start making people think. That's why in this presentation, you know, I tried to find, you know, we, it took a long time looking right. for pictures of girls, y'all. Um, you know, but looking for girls in, in these field-facing roles. And so we just need to create our own. This picture isn't even exactly right for what we do, but we need to create some that actually are with your employees. So let us know. Yeah, I just have a, I, I just have something to say, you know, in closing, if I can add an encouraging statement, you know, one of the areas that was displayed um, on the screen was we need women in, you know, the project management, uh, the project specialist IT area. Um, and something that was shared with me years ago, um, I was kind of intimidated by that position of managing projects. But if you're a woman and you have a family, if you're married, you manage a household, you are the ultimate project. You're right. Manager. I mean, yeah. what better you're absolutely right. What, yep. what better project can you work on than running a household, kids, working, you know, balancing, you know, your your husbands or you know your significant others, and that that is project management, the ultimate. So don't don't let that you know that area. Uh, intimidate you. You can do this. <laughs> mm -hmm. Just have a good sense of humor. I mean, I've made the joke about Porta Johns. I'm not kidding, y'all. Porta Johns <laughs> are horrible when you're a girl on a project site. I mean, <laughs> it's like Porta John, find the closest Taco Bell. Uh -huh. When my daughters were young, they used to ask me to please change out of my man's shoes before I picked them up from school. <laughs> they did not want me to pick them up from school in my man's shoes. Yep. And, you know, just stories like that are funny, you know? It's, Yep. Uh, well, I mean, you talk to young girls today and you start talking about being in the field and that's the first thing they go to. If I say plumber, pipe fitter, everybody in this room went to the guy bent over with his drawers, three quarters. <laughs> see, I've got people nodding three quarters of the way down there. That's what young women think of when you start talking about being in the field is they instantly go to that stereotypical view of a, a plumber or pipe fitter with his drawers down around his hind end. Um, if I was in the field, I'd be a lot more descriptive, but those are the things that we need to get up and over, but those are also the things we got to be able to laugh at because it's true. It, it, it absolutely is true. But as women and as mentors, or even as the men in this room, you just kind of have to be able to, all right, we're going to own that. We're going to enjoy it. We're going to move on from it. So we're getting the hook. <laughs> That's, that is true. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um. So yeah, those I think those are great closing thoughts. I love Monica's uh, great closing thoughts uh, mm -hmm. about project management, and uh, thank you all for coming. Um,